Greetings, listeners around the world, and welcome to the China History Podcast. We're coming to you via podcast RSS feed from www.chinahistorypodcast.com. I am your host and humble narrator, Laszlo Montgomery, bringing you yet another episode of our China Dynasties Overview. Sort of a special service provided to you weekly at no additional cost, of course, from us folks here at the China History Podcast. Last week, we looked at the short-lived and ill-fated Sui Dynasty of Wen Di and Yang Di, thanks to the efforts and achievements of the Sui Dynasty, who had unified the Middle Kingdom after 271 years of disunity, when the first Tang Dynasty emperor stepped foot in the imperial palace in Chang'an, he inherited a nice, turnkey, ready-made political, military, economic, fiscal, and legal system that allowed him to quickly start the task of stabilization and consolidation. With so much heavy lifting already having been taken care of during the Sui, China was brought to a height of glory that hadn't been seen since perhaps the time of the Western Han. And even the Western Han paled besides the shining magnificence of the Tang. The credit for founding the dynasty and fast-tracking things in the right direction belongs to the first two Tang emperors, Gao Zu and his much more brilliant and great in every way son, uh, Li Shimin, who reigned splendidly as Emperor Tang Taizong. From stem to stern, the Tang dynasty ran from 618 to 907, not quite three centuries. But for one of those centuries... Between the years 650 and 750 A.D., this was the Chinese century. I mean, Beijing Olympics? Bah, that was nothing compared to the kind of face China was walking around with in the 7th and 8th centuries. This time period was the best run of years China had ever seen since Yu the Great tamed the floods back in 2200 B.C. During this portion of the Tang Dynasty, from Emperors Taizong to Xuanzong, China was truly the Middle Kingdom. It was at the forefront of civilization on Earth. Its armies were the most powerful, its imperial court was the most enlightened. The open-mindedness of the rulers and the aristocracy was never more progressive. The government and political systems honed and refined over and over for centuries since the time of Han Gaozu, gave China the, the right to lay claim to the best-run government and administrative systems on the planet. The military as well was strong and efficiently run. The Tang Empire at its peak, east to west, ran from Korea to Persia, and north to south from Xinjiang and Kazakhstan to as far south as central Vietnam. Now, it's easy to say it ran this far, east, west, north, and south, the furthermost edges of the Tang, or any ancient empire, always were the most difficult to govern and hold on to for any sustained period of time, and this is true in the Tang as well. The Tang capital in Chang'an was the center of this most cosmopolitan of empires. There in Chang'an, this melange of Central Asian, Indian, Middle Eastern, and Persian cultures would be absorbed by the imperial court and the aristocrats, and then disseminated across Chinese society, or more accurately, across Chinese aristocratic society. The peasant's life was, and remained as it always was, tied to the land and the whims of nature. It was a million light years away from the refined and educated world and lifestyle of the Tang Dynasty aristocracy. It was a time of such advancement in all of the fine arts, especially in poetry, an 18th century Qing emperor, I don't know if it was uh, Kangxi, uh, Yongzheng, or Qianlong, uh, but they ordered all Tang poems to be compiled and organized into this anthology. And what he got was 30 volumes containing 48,900 poems by 2,300 poets. There were a lot other poets in Tang Dynasty China besides uh, Li Bai and uh, Du Fu. It was a golden time for the arts, and you saw poets and painters who were raised to high offices in the empire. Chang'an, which of course is modern-day Xi'an in uh, Shanxi province, was so beautiful that even in the 7th and 8th centuries, 
you would get tourists who would come from India and as far as the fringes of Europe. Zoroastrians and Nestorian Christians flocked to Chang'an and were welcomed and protected by Taizong, who was like uh, Akbar the Great almost a thousand years later, acting like a patron of the arts and threw China open to any and all influences these foreign ideas gave. China began to export grain, rice, corn, silk, spices. There was so much surplus. The mandate of heaven just couldn't have been more secure. The Grand Canal and all of China's great and near great waterways were alive with commerce. From Tang China harbors sailed vessels that sailed to ports in Persia and India. Silk was selling for its weight in gold in Europe, yet on the streets of Chang'an and other aristocratic centers in the north and south, silk was a common fabric. Fur coats were more plentiful in 8th century Chang'an than in 20th century New York City. Never before had China been so wealthy and commanded so much attention, and awe, and admiration from all worlds they came in contact with. A census in 609 showed there were 9 million households, which roughly translated to 50 million people living in Tang Dynasty China. And during this time, when China was preeminent in the world, Europe was mired in darkness. Muslim armies were on the rampage in North Africa and the Western world, and it was only in 732 that Charles Martel was able to stop their advance at Tours. And, and when Charles the Hammer was holding back the Umayyad conquerors at Tours and being the last line of defense of Christendom and Western civilization, in China it was the peak years of the peak reign of the peak dynasty. The Tang was also contemporary with the establishment of the Carolingian dynasty and Charlemagne reigned as king of the Franks. Contemporary with the Tang, you also had the age of the Vikings and all the kinds of stress they gave to the people of Northern Europe. While Europe was still sorting itself out 300 years after the abdication of Romulus Augustulus in 476, China was thriving and advancing on all fronts. It all started in March of 618 with the death of Emperor Yang Di of Sui. As I mentioned in the last podcast, the power behind the throne by now was one Li Yuan. He was able to trace his ancestry back to, to Li Gao, the, the founder of the Western Liang Dynasty during the Sixteen Kingdoms period. Li Yuan uh, installed this boy emperor, Gong Di, on the throne. If you recall, the Sui Emperor Yang Di retired after the Korean debacles and went down to Jiangdu to live out his years in a cloud of debauchery. But... Once Yang Di died, this Gong Di was quickly removed from power, and in June of 618, Li Yuan establishes the Tang Dynasty, since he had been the Duke of Tang. His main task was to bring into the fold all the wayward warlords and contenders who had strayed during the final chaotic years of the Sui and to unify the country once again. Now, this task uh, more or less was completed by 628, although by 624, all that had to be done was some mopping up and reorganization of the military. In the meantime, he adopted all these sway policies and systems, but loosened up on the more harsh penalties and took the legal codes produced during uh, Yang Di's time and refined them even further. Now, the main event for the purposes of this podcast was a gentleman named Li Shermin, this is the third son of Li Yuan. The founding emperor had two other surviving sons, uh, Li Jiancheng, the eldest and the crown prince, and uh, Li Yuanji, the youngest. These two sons were allied with each other against uh, Li Shimin. Their father, Li Yuan, now reigning as Emperor Tang Gaozu, was not as strong a character as his third son, Li Shermin, whose prowess on the battlefield and as a strategist earned him the reputation uh, as the co-founder with the Li Yuan of the Tang Dynasty. Now, the crown prince and eldest brother, he too fought with his father and earned a reputation for leadership and bravery, but his battles, compared to Li Shermin's battles, just didn't compare. Now, Emperor Gaozu, he sort of waffled back and forth. First he picks Li Jiancheng, and then he says, oh, perhaps you should go with uh, Li Shermin. And you can imagine and you can imagine the factions in Chang'an working behind the scenes like you probably cannot even imagine using their influence to get this 
indecisive emperor to choose their man. These two brothers were the ones who led the armies on behalf of the father to rein in all these independent centers of power in the south and the northeast and central plains. I mean, when Li Yuan established the Tang and became Emperor Tang Gaozu, they really only controlled the area where the old Qin state was in the Wei River Valley. These two brothers, now locked in this fight to the death, were the tip of the spear to unify China again, which took about five years to do. In the summer of 626, after months of the most over-the-top, high-stakes maneuvering between the two brothers, Li Shermin prevailed. At the Xuanwu Gate... July 2nd, 626, the fourth day of the sixth moon, at the gate leading to the emperor's palace in Chang'an, in walked the two brothers, Li Jiancheng and Li Yuanqi. Li Shermin was the one who actually shot the arrow that killed Li Jiancheng. Both brothers were eliminated. Li Shermin was only 27 years old when all this was going down, and he had already defeated numerous opponents on the battlefield. So, this uh, Li Shermin, after he kills his brothers, who were his rivals and archenemies, he blows in on Emperor Gaozu, his father, and tells him uh, the way it has to be from now on, but this is not before he prostrates himself before his father to beg forgiveness for his hand and the death of the emperor's two other surviving sons. So the whole upshot of all this was Li Shermin became the crown prince, and two months later, the founder of the Tang dynasty, Li Yuan, Tang Gaozu, abdicates in favor of the crown prince, and then the good times are about to roll for China. So Li Shermin reigned as Emperor Tang Taizong. Many consider him the greatest, and if not the greatest, then certainly the most heroic of all China's emperors. He's certainly in the top three greatest, and there were plenty of good ones between Yu the Great and Pu Yi. He reigned from 626 to 649, not quite a quarter century. Now, he brought imperial China to new heights of greatness. He presided over not only a period of pacification and territorial expansion, but also vigorous internal renewal within the empire. And believe it or not, as great as things got during the reign of Taizong, the best was still yet to come under Xuanzong, or Tang Minghuang, as he is more commonly known. He followed later on, about 40 years after the death of uh, Taizong. So the Turkic Central Asians, especially the Tujie, or Eastern Turkic Kaganic, presented a first big challenge to the new emperor, but he was able to finally defeat them, and by 630 they were hardly the menace they had been. He began his reign by using the same strategy as his father. He paid them off with tribute. This worked, sort of, but some 14 years later, in 642, the Tang Empire were the masters of Central Asia. The ultimate defeat of the Turks was the defining major achievement of Tang Taizong. Pacifying the north and northwest Mongols and Turks was the holy grail of every emperor going all the way back to the Shang But under Taizong, it became a reality. It was at this time that the land we also know as Turkestan was given the name Xinjiang, or New Frontier. This emperor is also a figure of great admiration for his utter devotion to Confucian virtues. Now, this embracement of Confucianism followed the most un-Confucian of beginnings he had. He has a well, first, he was a bloodthirsty general on the battlefield and murderer of his two brothers and the black hand behind his father's forced abdication. Yeah, despite all that, Confucianism and Taizong's reign went very well together. His reputation went down as a leader who was diligent and got involved in the day-to-day governance of the country's affairs. He chose excellent administrators and listened to his advisors He reformed agriculture to the extent that farmers had it quite good compared to the hardships of the past. In times of famine in some areas, Taizong made sure there was ample famine relief whenever and wherever needed. The kingdom of Tibet was down in the southwest, where the Himalayas to the south and the Tibetan plateau to the north. During this period of Taizong, the Tibetan empire was in full bloom, and During this Tang period, you're now starting to get more regular interaction between China and this mysterious southwestern kingdom. Their king, born a year before the founding of the Tang, was Songstan Gampo, also the founder of the Tibetan Empire. The relationship between Tang China and Tibet was a complicated one, but 
One interesting thing to know, Tai Tsung married off one of his nieces to Song Stan Gampo. This was done to keep peace at a precarious time. She was the famous Princess Wencheng, or Wencheng Gongzhu. She married the Tibetan king when he was 37 years old, at 641. She, coming from the Tang court, was a devout Buddhist, and it is she, Princess Wencheng, who played a major role in bringing Buddhism and Chinese culture to Tibet, and with her husband, the king, popularized it around the Himalayan kingdom. Songstan Gampo is also credited with being the founder of the city of Lhasa. Tai Tsung was not lucky in family affairs. One son, Li Yo, uh, in 643, rose up against his father, but this was put down and he was forced to commit suicide for his crime. The crown prince, Li Cheng Qian, was next, although his conspiracy was much broader and even included the emperor's brother. He made his move against his father in advance of what he was certain was going to be a move to get rid of him first. Li Cheng Qian's rival, which was his brother Li Tai, was then made uh, crown prince, but after Tai Tsung learned that it was Li Tai's treachery that pushed Li Cheng Qian to rebel in the first place, and that furthermore Li Tai had designs to do away with his younger brother Li Zhi, well, he had Li Tai exiled, and Li Zhi was then made crown prince, and with that, all the pieces were now in place that would lead to the rise and triumph of the Empress Wu Zetian. During the reign of the great Taizong Emperor, China's territory was greatly expanded and was turned into a multinational, multicultural empire. And he reached out to neighboring lands and lands far away and established cultural and political and economic ties. Li Shimin Tang Taizong Di died in his 50th year in 649. Now we'll look at the next emperor, Gaozong, until the time when Wu Zetian's influence on the throne is complete in 683, and we'll end there. I'll re-up the Wu Zetian podcast episode for those who haven't heard it yet, and to keep the continuity going on our little dynasty overview series. Then we'll pick up again after the fall of Wu Zetian. So by this time, the Tang Dynasty has seen and done great things. It hasn't all been easy. There have been wars and the usual disturbances along the fringes of the empire. Very efficient and effective administration and bureaucracy has been set up, and this whole empire-wide system was serviced by an army of Confucian scholar officials who made their way up the ranks of the Chinese Confucian bureaucratic cursus and arm. The imperial civil service exams, like they used to have in the time of the Western Han, are by now back in full force. But by mid to late Tang, after a while, there came a time of mass corruption up and down the ranks, and serving in the bureaucracy was soon looked at as a way to potential riches. So Guan Fa Cai. Buddhism had been fully embraced by the empire and beyond the empire as well. And from Buddhism came the necessity to have a convenient medium from which to efficiently disseminate and study the Buddhist sutras. This necessity led to the Tang Dynasty invention of printing, although this came more in the 9th century. By the time of the Emperor Gaozong, surely the R&D for printing, so to speak, was fully underway. Li Zhi, or Emperor Gaozong, was only 22 years old when he filled the very big shoes of his father, the Taizong Emperor. He isn't considered a great or an assertive emperor, though he did last for 33 years. Historians all seem in agreement. He was of generally weak character. But weak character or no weak character, the Gaozong Emperor succeeded where Taizong failed. Both the Sui Emperor Yang Di and the Tang Emperor Taizong both tried and failed miserably to conquer Korea. But Gaozong, between 660 and 665, uh, first took Pekche, and Shila, uh, that was the second of the three kingdoms, was already showing suzerainty to Tang China and their alliance with uh, Tang unified the Korean peninsula when they finally together overpowered Koguryo. The Koreans, not being anyone you want to mess with, were not an easy people to keep down, and by 676, the unified kingdom of Shila kicked the Tang uh, out of Korea. In 665, things were looking good for Gaozong, but then suddenly the Western Turks rose up in open rebellion, and five years later, the Tibetans were overrunning the Tarim Basin, and then from 682 to 721, the Mongolian Turks 
savagely attacked south of the Great Wall and for almost four decades gave the Tonga a headache up in the north. And speaking of headaches, the Tang Emperor Gao Zong in the mid-670s is starting to suffer from all these persistent headaches. A series of strokes followed, and by this time his empress Wu Zetian was in control, and whatever happens in China by this time is attributed to her rather than to her husband, the emperor. However, by 683, the emperor Gao Zong, he dies, and Wu Zetian is in complete control until she passes from the scene in 705. Now, this whole period of all the sordid details of Wu Zetian's humble beginnings as a junior concubine to the Taizong Emperor and then to the heights of power is all chronicled in the Wu Zetian podcast that I will uh, re-upload. Now, we're leaving the Tang at what looks to be a bad time. By the time of the third emperor, indeed, things are precarious, but despite the bad rap Wu Zetian gets from historians, all are in agreement that once she clawed and scratched her way to power, leaving plenty of blood and corpses along the way, she turned out to be a very good ruler and administrator. Once we get past Wu Zetian's time, you have the reign of Emperor Ming or Xuanzong, which is where the Tang peaks, and then it's all downhill from there until the bitter end comes in 907. But I didn't get into it yet because I want to dedicate an entire podcast on the subject. But during this period of the Tang, especially during this Pax Sinica period that set in after the North and West were pacified or pacified enough to allow trade routes to prosper without hindrance. And, and the, the granddaddy of them all, the premier trade route, was none other than the Sichou the Silk Road. It was one big pipeline from which all kinds of luxuries, commodities, foodstuffs, and all kinds of exotica traveled back and forth. Maybe some of these things going east to west and west to east might be commonplace to us in the 21st century, but in the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries, almost nothing was commonplace. Everything was new. And this, of course, wasn't limited to physical commodities and curiosities and the like. The Silk Road was also a channel where ideas as well traveled back and forth. New inventions were seen by Westerner and Chinese alike for the first time, and perhaps some of these technologies were perfected back in their own homeland based on what each other by chance observed. You know, it's about now. Things are really starting to kick in right now. Uh, You know, the 500s, 600s, 700s. This is where we really start to see big-time, day-in, day-out interaction between all the peoples in what is now uh, present-day Europe, Russia, the Middle East, Central Asia, China, India, Vietnam, Cambodia, Korea. I mean, we're far along enough where, you know, by this time, everybody's talking to everybody. It's all done in a very slow and primitive way, but it all had to start somewhere. And the Silk Road during the Tang Dynasty was the perfect conduit where a lot of this intercultural exchange and all the overland trading was happening. Trade was interrupted many times. I mean, after all, Central Asia back then, believe it or not, still had a lot in common with Central Asia today. So you could Imagine the potential flashpoints between uh, Luoyang in the east and uh, the Black Sea in the west. The 4,000 miles of the Silk Road carried a lot of ideas, schools of thought, governing methods, astronomical observations, chemicals, remedies, and legends. We'll come back and revisit the Silk Road another day. And I think we... We'll just stop right here with the weak Emperor Gao Zong's passing in 683. The Tang Dynasty is about to get thrown on its head with the long and, well, glorious to some extent, reign of the only woman in Chinese history to rule in her own right as emperor, or in her case, empress. She took the Tang to new heights, but it was years after her passing that we get the real crown jewel in the Tang Dynasty, the Ming Emperor. Until then, if you haven't yet heard the Wu Zetian podcast, I'm going to re-upload this one and note in its title that it's a rebroadcast. Then the following week, we'll continue on at about uh, 7.05 with the death of Wu Zetian. Another 200 years to go yet for the Tang. And so, from the pleasant little American town of Claremont, California, where 
Although not for long, the late and great Frank Zappa once lived. This is Laszlo Montgomery welcoming you to visit our website anytime at www.chinahistorypodcast.com. You can also find us in the iTunes Store and many other fine podcast directories. Please join us next week, won't you, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.